uh, I believe everyone's here. And, uh... Okay, well, welcome to our presentation. We are the Queens Mostly Autonomous Cello Team, acronym QMAST. Uh, we are from Queens University in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, my name is Nick. This is I'm Michael. I'm Evan. Adrian. And Evan's going to start by telling you a little bit about our team. So, the Mostly Autonomous Sailboat team is an undergraduate extracurricular team. We design and build and test robotic sailboats. Uh, we have about 25 students on the team, all undergraduates, no professors involved, no graduate students. So it's a lot of work for students who are, who are still learning how engineering works. Uh, we've been involved in robotic sailboats since, uh, since Sailbot was sort of founded in uh, 2006 or so. Um, so we are, in the past few years, we've been working on the Microtransat challenge. It was uh, quite difficult. We, we've got a four meter boat that we were working on, but we put it on hold for now while we come back to Sailbot and uh, own our autonomous code again. Uh, yeah. So I first got involved in first year when uh, there was a school project that was a part of the robotic sailboat team. And since then, I've worked on the boat and I've uh, started to help lead the team and I'll continue to do so next year. The mechanical team probably has about eight students on it. And we design the hulls, the rigging, the, the rudders, all the, all the physical boat aspects. And then we build that as well. So the design process started last year. Uh, we were really inspired by the America's Cup as I'm sure many people were. Uh, the catamarans there are just amazing, so we wanted to make our own. Uh, catamarans are known for being fast and uh, light, and we hadn't made one before. Uh, so that's uh, how we started. Uh, our boat is also a swing rig, so that means that our booms for our jib and main are joined, and they rotate around the mast. So it's not standard, but uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, tactic for a, a model boat. And uh, finally, a, a large part of the design process was looking at uh, racing catamarans and trying to figure out what ratios we should use for our sail area to hull length and our to the weight in their heels and our rudder length and that sort of thing. Our construction started in January. Uh, a key component was making the hulls. So we made a uh, female mold, a plug, uh, sorry, a male plug. Uh, you can see at the top right here. Uh, we had laser cutouts for the profiles and then we glued lots of foam pieces together and sanded it into the proper shape. Uh, we used a similar tactic for our rudders and keels. This is uh, one of our keels here and that is the fiberglassing of one of our rudders there. We have steel rods for supports and this is, uh, there's some lead inside here for our keels. The finish on our rudders and keels was uh, completed with a vacuum bagging process so we'd get uh, a, a better better fiberglass and coat. All right, so I'm Adrian. I joined the team in uh, March, actually, very recently. And I joined the team because I really love sailing uh, and I love doing the uh, like hands-on mechanical engineering work. And I was actually I would work with Mike here all summer full time on the boat, which is an amazing opportunity. So as you can see here, uh, this is the result of our mold. Uh, uh, three layers of fiberglass and one layer of carbon fiber. And in the next picture there, in the bottom left, you can see it assembled. We have our keels in there with the lead. And uh, our cross beams were secured with bulkheads over fiberglass to the hull and screwed in. And the uh, part of the crossing here is like a very secure mass step that allows us to have no stays in our boat. It's uh, very stable, so we don't need a back stay, forward stay, or in shrouds. Uh, and also, you can see the sail there. It was made by Kingston Sail Off, which is a local sail making company. And uh, as Evan said, we figured out uh, proportions and dimensions of our sail uh, and a rough shape, but they basically finished it off for us and manufactured it, and uh, it's been working very well for us. Uh, this is a picture of the boat on Lake Ontario. Uh, as you can see, there's the 
But yeah, so it's 16 meters long, unstated, as I said before. Uh, two rudders, obviously, the catamaran, two servos to control those, and the two keels to uh, prevent drifting in high winds. And uh, yeah, the, we just have one winch motor that controls uh, the mainsail as a result of jib as well, with an offset jib slot that we can adjust. And the boat was designed to not heal in 15 knots, which is the competition limit. So that works well for us. We don't have any uh, dumping in high winds. So as long as it's not more than that, it's uh, a very good boat to have. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of testing as well uh, before we came in May, uh, like three or four times. Uh, some very light wind days, some very heavy wind days. Kingston is also a very good place for wind. We almost capsized once actually, very close. Um, but we've been having a lot of fun with it and uh, we were just tweaking some things before the competition. So yeah, and then Nick's gonna talk to you about electrical systems now. So yeah, my name's Nick. Um, I joined the team in the first year and I worked all last summer on the electrical part of the boat as Mike and Adrian are doing this summer. That's how our team functions um, in the summer. So I helped lead the electrical team, um, about half of which is shown here. We're responsible for selecting uh, which sensors we use, connecting them to the computing hardware, which uh, make decisions and control the rudders and winch motor, and then powering the system and connecting everything together. Uh, we use a lot of off-the-shelf components in terms of um, sensors and Arduino boards, et cetera, but we build and um, design all our electronics boxes and cables, et cetera, ourselves. This is a map of our system on the boat. It's a little bit outdated um, based on some adjustments we've made at the competition, but it's pretty accurate. So we have sort of two modules on board. Um, we have our power and control box, which houses our uh, power system and our motor controllers. And we have our computing box, which um, houses our main computing systems, receives all the data from our wind sensor um, and our webcam for the computer vision challenge, communicates the decisions made to the power and control box, um, which houses two motor controller units and turns the winch and or the rudders. So we take a pretty modular approach to designing and testing our electrical systems. We work very closely with the software team, which is our third sub team. Uh, when we're choosing which, to eat, which components to use and making sure everything works. So we have our wind sensor, making sure that we can get just raw data to our computing systems before moving on to um, connecting communication systems between our motor controllers, making sure everything's powered properly, instead of just sort of plugging everything, plugging everything in and hoping it works. Um, it's a pretty good way to do it. This is a picture of our very messy but functional power box and control systems bo or motor controller box. It's a watertight box um, with industrial grade watertight connectors. Um, and this is our computing box, which is a little tidier. Um, our main computing system, our main computing module, so to speak, is an Arduino Mega, um, which receives all of the data, makes the decisions, and sends it off to the motor controllers. The a Raspberry Pi is what we use for our computer vision um, processing. Um, a big part of our electrical system uh, are the custom PCBs that we design as a team. So this one's called Moby, as in Moby Dick. Um, and you can see our, our names on there, our logos on there, houses, um, some logic shifting circuitry, uh, some smaller power systems for computing um, hardware, a couple um, connectors just to consolidate the wires. You saw how messy that um, electronics box was. Without this, it would be even crazier. Um, that's in the power systems box. This one's called Ahab, it's in Captain Ahab, also for Moby Dick, um, which is a shield that we designed for our Arduino Mega, again, to house a couple of smaller sensors um, and connect some, connect some things together with some shifting circuitry as well. So that's a pretty important part of our system. Um, and that's about it for electrical. Mike's gonna talk to you about the software team. Okay, so my name is Mike, as before, and I've been working on the software for the boat for the past year with a bunch of other students, as well as I was hired by Queens to work through the summer on software. Adrian and I have been working on it together. You can see our team there is missing uh, me. I think I would have 
who's deemed a distraction in the photo if I've been there or something like that. But um, our team has range, changed sizes quite a few times. Uh, one thing about the software team is you know a lot of people come in with different experience levels, and you'll have someone in first year who just learned how to you know code a simple motor forward and backwards, and it's a lot it's a lot of different various levels of what people can do. So you have a lot of different components that have to come together, and I spent a lot of time this summer just taking people's stuff and trying to make it work. Even uh, some people said, "Oh, I can only work in Java," so they made something in Java and we had to translate it to C or C plus plus for it to work in uh, the box. But things are things are looking pretty good right now. So as you can see, there's about four main things the software team does. We work on uh, controlling the rudders and the winch from through the controllers, as well as parsing sensor data from our AMR sensor at the top. And uh, a main, or the biggest thing that we do is work on navigation algorithms for sailing upwind and take a lot of things there. And once we get to that, you can see we have a pretty complex system that's almost working how we would like it. It's uh, still a work in progress. So, yeah, can you continue? Uh, our main code here is called Scooter Code, that's what the cloud is called. And the way we work is through a system of modes. So our main loop in our, uh, our main C file would be only about you know, a little more, a few more lines than that. And we avoid loops at all costs because we want to be able to, at any time, avoid something. So let's say we're in remote control mode and all of a sudden the RC cuts out and both sailing away. We could say, you know, go to lock mode where we just lock the rudders and release the winch and stop and things like that. It's very nice for, uh, avoiding trouble, although it does require a little more thinking as we go through. So, you know, one of our modes, like we said, would be remote control mode. This is where it's only controlled through the remote control. And at any time, we can leave this. And each time we go, we calibrate the remote. So it's usually pretty exact each time we go. Uh, we also can go through a command line interface. Uh, we, uh, I spent some time this summer setting up XPs. We're not quite at the point where we can upload wirelessly. We still have to USB in. We're working on that. But uh, through the command line, we can do things like set an absolute position of the rudders or move the winch to certain the speed or even get diagnostics of the whole box, which is really nice if uh, you're booting up the system, you can see the voltage going through each uh, device and see if there's any errors on any of the controllers. So it, you know, it makes it a little easier to debug if some problems do happen. But uh, the, I guess the largest portion of our software team is working on auto sale. And uh, so here's one of our parts would be station keeping. Station keeping, we kind of just set up, always try and get into the wind and stay still. A good thing about a catamaran is if you're facing the wind, you pretty much stop moving. That's also one of the problems with catamarans, and that adds some trouble in attacking. But yesterday, we did have a successful auto sail attack, which was very nice to see. Uh, if we move on to the next slide here, this is sort of our main idea. It's somewhat similar to Virginia Tech's uh, navigation is that we create every single, you know, every time we run our nav score, we call it, is a function that takes a score of every single degree based on things like how far you are from the waypoint, which is done through GPS, or what the wind angle is, even heading we can use. We also have made it so that there's options to add things such as other boats that are coming at you, or you know land masses that you can program in ahead of time. Now, we have not, those aren't currently running it, but there are spots for it. But the idea is every degree has a certain score that is that you can be used, and the best score is where you will go to. And uh, we run this every few seconds, and usually uh, the rudders would stay straight if you're going in a good position. But let's say you're going up diagonally like this, and you wanted to go down. You turn your rudder, or we set our rudders based on how far we would have to turn, and it seems to run quite smoothly. And uh, it's pretty exciting stuff to be working on. And uh, the last thing is working with our air mar sensor. Our air mar sensor provides us with pretty much all the information we'd ever want on the water. And uh, we, I, I've spent a lot of time working on parsing the data from that. And uh, it can be uh, pretty useful at all times. We found it's a very good device. It's a little expensive, but it's definitely worth it if you want uh, to get some really accurate results as you're moving. And that's pretty much how the software team runs. And that actually concludes our presentation. So thanks for listening. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you. Um, Could have been that good. <laughs> so uh, I'm a software guy by trade. Uh, and I like. So we went into this completely naive. We just went to the internet and you know, 45 degrees. That was our rule of thumb. And very very naive. But I like uh, the part of your presentation that details how to um, start thinking better about how to navigate. And I appreciate that you put that in there because we're going to steal that from you next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So when uh, a catamaran, obviously I've seen your boat and I, don't, I think these guys probably have all seen your boat too. So you've got two keels and two rudders. Is there an issue with keeping all that in alignment? Does it create drag? I assume it creates drag if they're out of alignment at all. How do you ensure that you're uh, aligned right on the water? So uh, there's a we run the rudders in the winch through a daisy chain. Basically, the two rudders are linked up. Anytime one uh, we set up a function that moves them both at the same degree, but obviously the calibration is very different. Even we'll have a piece of a servo say break off, and we have to change the the piece that's on top of the servo. And now it's going to be changed at different angles, right? So we use mapping to, we first calibrate what we would find the maximum of both of them would be, as well as what the center would be. And we have uh, constants for those. And then uh, what we do is we map it to a like, negative 1,000 to 1,000. And even if, let's say, one of them requires a server to turn 200 more, it's still the equivalent because it's been mapped to a certain ratio. And we usually have to calibrate that maybe once every couple of weeks to make sure it's good. Or sometimes if we hit a bump, we have to redo it that right then. You know, on your software loop, you, you you mentioned that in order for you to take radio control of the boat, you have to go through your software. So if your software crashes, you uh, We currently haven't had any software crashes, which is, <laughs> which is nice. Software got my trick, so you... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, usually, we're the XB range, the XB range, we try and stay close enough to the boat that if anything did really bad happen, but we have... A bunch of functions set up that will we, we ensure that there's no loops anywhere there's nowhere in any code that we've used that says while well, this do this that way it never seems to end up in any trouble and then again that, that's probably our main way of protecting ourselves from that situation yeah, like presentation. Okay. so I, I i have two questions there i'll start start you off on the experimental versus actual results and i'll just lead into why i'm asking this is because we we done analysis on Trixie, mm -hmm. our old boat, and it was supposed to be a speed demon, and <laughs> the actual results was that it was a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> so so how how does your experimental results compare right. with your actual? Okay, results? so um, I showed a picture of uh, some fluid flow around our hulls. That was just an, an early uh, sort of test after we had made the model. We were just um, trying to look at what what we might get from it. We're not especially experienced with uh, CFDs, but we, we did adjust our our design. We were just gonna go straight back with our uh, with our hulls so they'd be parallel at the transom mm -hmm. for ease of manufacturing, but we found that it did make a big difference, so we made a traditional hull shape. Um, aside from that, we haven't designed any boats for three years sort of, so we've actually lost a lot of knowledge um, and we didn't know what to expect exactly with our catamaran. So um, it's performed uh, as good as we could hope for without, uh, without advanced simulations or uh, comparing it to a, a, another catamaran we had or, or other two meter boats. And in terms of the actual results, I think I would credit it mostly to the fact that our boat sits very high in the water. We have two fairly large hulls, so there isn't much drag, uh, and also the fact that we don't have to have a big, like, small keel. We're already uh, relatively stable being a catamaran, so we have our our boat only weighs 30 pounds without uh, the equipment inside it. So I, yeah, I would say that's why we have pretty good speed. That's very impressive. Yeah. After testing too, we pretty much sealed all holes. We take almost zero water when we're sailing, which is nice to have. That's an incredibly good for the we, First time we've done it, we had 30 pounds for, yeah. I guess, each hull, maybe. So it okay. ended up to be 60. So. Yeah. yeah, you can see it there. It's, it's, it's barely in the water. Yeah. Uh, and then I really got to ask you one. Uh, all your diagnostic and navigation is done through the Arduino, is it? Pretty much everything's run through Arduino. The Raspberry Pi that we had was only for wireless communication as well as computer vision. Well, neither of those are currently being used in the system because computer vision was a little bit tough to get, but hopefully by the end of summer I can get some results for that. Oh, okay. Uh, are you using interrupts in the, in your code? The, the yeah. So, um, sorry, just give me a second while I get to it. So, um, the the only interrupts we have 
correct me if I'm wrong, are the encoders. So we have um, a uh, dual pulse chain, pulse train from the callback encoders on our main sail winch. Um, and those in interrupts from that chain are received by your Arduino Mini. It's not in here, obviously, but that's right, that's right. an outline of a Mini around oh, the, okay. the left so of the board. The so the Mini counts the in interrupts, and then the Omega asks the Mini when it wants it. So With the separate board, it never ends up affecting the main code, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually exactly what we've done. So <laughs> that's pretty neat. Yeah, no, you. You guys should all give uh, Mark a beer after for coding with the Arduino. We found it difficult to. <laughs> it it has kind of tweaks that it. Would you would you go to strictly the Pi if you could? I like the Arduinos. I mean, there's limitations, but I, I I having the two Arduinos working, we haven't really ran into too many issues. A lot of our team, like with Queens, we've worked a lot with Arduinos. Just a lot of in our EC department used them a lot, so we're very comfortable with them. Okay. Yeah. Just, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, we were looking at his votes. We found that Catamarans turn a lot, that it was a lot harder to turn them. How did you like change that? Uh, I mean, I don't think we could have, we didn't have like that calculation as to how well you attack. Or anything. Obviously, I think if you made a catamaran too long, you wouldn't be able to attack. Um, but even in light winds and heavy wind, we were able to uh, to attack. So we actually didn't have much issue with that. And we found we pointed relatively well when compared to the monohull boats. So I would say that we didn't get many of the disadvantages of the catamaran. Uh, yeah, it definitely has a larger turning radius than the meter long. Monohulls that uh, you guys are sailing, um, and probably if we went to a, like a three meter catamaran, we would have troubles and the size restrictions with this competition. But this size of catamaran seems to be okay for the sail lot. Any question here? Uh, it was more of a comment, really. Uh, uh, you indicated early in your presentation that uh, early in your in your design process, you chose a catamaran design as opposed to a monohull. And uh, I guess the, it's, a, it's a fairly radical, uh, fundamental decision to make early in the game. And uh, I, I didn't see it. Maybe you can comment on this, uh, whether you had uh, uh, done any uh, design uh, iterations or synthesis to eliminate monohulls and chose the catamaran for that design, or what other aspects uh, led into that decision. Because that, that's a, a very major, fundamental decision early in the game that could have spelled success or failure. Right? Um, well, the, the design process lasted uh, close to a year. We went back and forth between uh, monohulls and catamarans. We, we also considered trimarans. Um, mainly, we wanted to increase enthusiasm in the team. We hadn't had a lot of returning members, and it, it makes it a lot harder to build any boat if you just have two or three committed members to build a full boat. And People who are interested in sailing, they, they often think of catamarans as a more exciting option. And mm -hmm. so uh, a big factor was um, drumming up enthusiasm. Uh, we, we looked at uh, a lot of catamarans that are in production and tried to use similar dimensions so that we wouldn't have a, we wouldn't have a boat that doesn't function. Uh, so the the keels, the rudders, they're not, they're not irregular from other uh, catamarans that you might sail. Um, so it, it was a big decision, but uh, our members had been working on micro transact for a number of years, and um, the monohull there wasn't, wasn't producing the results we wanted, so we just, we just tried something new. Good. Thank you. Yeah, let's follow up a little bit on that as well then. So, um, so you guys, on the microtransmit, it's, it's, it's monohull, obviously, and then so you decided to move to the, to the, the cap. Uh, um, no, you guys did, uh, you guys did capsize, I understand, earlier in the game. No, we, we didn't capsize. Mike actually, oh, okay. like, caught the boat. It was at a 60 degree heel. Actually, we hit a 25 knot cost. Yeah. We were testing once, but it was, 
It has potential to. So we filled it with lead after that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that's the point I'm getting to. But certainly, okay. they do have that yeah. tendency to, yeah. to capsize and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I guess that's my question now. I guess you guys are looking at addressing that in higher winds. So you're looking at additional ballast and so yeah. on. Yeah. 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 We after that we got like eight pounds of lead and put it in the other side. Okay. Because part of the problem is we had we didn't even really realize this, but we had eight pounds of electrical equipment in one hull and none in the other. So oh. only a port holes on one side. So we stuffed a bunch of lead in the port hole for the servo. Okay. And that it helps for sure, right. but we could probably use the plan a bit more. Okay. For assurance. The, the boat was designed for the 15 knot limit at sailbot. Right. And so if we were going to try an Atlantic crossing, we definitely wouldn't do it with the catamaran. Right. We just felt comfortable here, and when we were testing in higher winds, it was the risk we were taking. Okay. Okay. Um, on the construction side, it just um, you guys have a very in interesting uh, combination. So you guys used a, a fiberglass, and then you said you had a layer of carbon fiber over top. Is that right? It's quite that. Uh, yes. Uh, blend, I guess. So we decided that the carbon fiber mixed with fiberglass, uh, the different layers would provide additional strength. Uh, it's sort of uh, an estimate. We didn't have any proof, but uh, we had fiber, uh, sorry, the carbon fiber already um, from previous years, and we decided we might as well use it instead of going and buying a lot of extra fiber as well. Okay, all right. So, okay. It's sort so, of a sandwich. Yeah. So, a sandwich of, 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 of a carbon fiber layer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you guys are yeah. looking at that from a strength perspective. Yeah. And, right. Obviously, not so much on the weight side, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it's just an epoxy standard. Okay. All right. Yeah. So how many layers did they make in the beginning? There was three of fiberglass. Three, three of fiberglass. Yeah. Okay. All right. Question. Do you have a question in the back there? Um, so it's for the program. Uh, we work pretty much exclusively with Arduino as well. And a problem we ran into was the Arduino's built-in delay function. It doesn't really like more than one function at a time. I was wondering if you ran into that problem. Yeah, the, there's a function like millis, which will return like a time since the program started, and that can go up to 50 days long. And so if you use that instead of delays for all your timers, it makes it so that you can just say, has it been, if you say like millis minus the last time we were here, has it been long enough to do this? Otherwise, keep going through. And you know, you got to keep using ifs and avoid all the delays you possibly can. Yeah, we, well, we ended up using a third party library. Right. Yeah, I think Billy's is uh, part of the the core Arduino library. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm starting here. So, when you're when you're doing your like the navigation, you're you're saying you're neglecting if statements or like how you avoiding or, while statements. Yeah. Okay. Because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we uh, every time we even added one of them, just to say you know, while this wait for this or something, you almost always eventually end up getting stuck in a loop, especially with sailing. Because when data is coming in, sometimes it's not the data you're expecting, so you've got to keep on trying, keep on trying. It's it's dangerous sitting in a loop. Right? Did you did you put a schedule or in for like all your events or how did you sort them? It's pretty much just a constant loop going through at all times, just like very very quickly, like a hundred yeah. times a second almost, right? Oh. And uh, it's just based on perimeter ifs, and we update things constantly. And if there's a significant change in our data, then we would enter something. Um, yeah, but it's, it's pretty, uh, it runs at the Aramar's time. The Aramar data is not necessarily consistent at all times. Sometimes, you know, it'll just, it'll miss a line, right? So you have to kind of work on its turns. Okay. Good. Anybody else? I think we should take a break. Nobody else has any questions? Who's going to be next after the break? It's on the. I think it's.